Good evening. <laughs> and first of all, I will also say a very warm welcome to you at Mondeval. I am, you, know, you must excuse me if I'm kind of shaky, because uh, I've been living with your books for so many years. I've been reading them. Last winter, for my for my uh, girlfriend, uh, we I read it loud the whole winter, and 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 then so being here with you uh, is such an occasion for me to Thank to you. to have the chance to have a chance to uh, to ask you questions. Uh, you are a wonderful writer, but you are a potter, and you write as a potter, and and that's what I I I read many books and and and. All of a sudden, I realize that you can write the way you do with that sense of uh, touching things, with that love for things. So thank you very much um, for being here. Can I ask one question to the audience? How many of you of you know the hair with the amber eyes? Yeah, I thought it. I yes, love. Yes, well, I, I love you all. <laughs> <laughs> So we don't have to give very much introduction to the hair with the amber eyes, and I, I'm sure you feel like me that it is w you read this book and you kind of go into it, and and it stays with you for the for the rest of your life. It's 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 such a wonderful book. It's about this uh, Eastern European Jewish Ashkenazi family, Les Frusi. Um and now you have written. Letters to Commando, who is, who was, a member of this uh, Spanish Jewish Sephardi family. Uh, fortunately, you are alive, uh, but yes. no one from the Commando family is alive. Yeah. So, where do we begin? I mean, in one way to begin, I suppose, is to say that I've been living this particular story, the story of the Camondo family, for as long as I've been living the story of my own family, the Afrusi family, um, th they were neighbors. Um, the Camondo family came from Constantinople in the same year um, that my Afrusi family came from Odessa. You know, two great Jewish dynastic families moving very, very interesting. Moving from places where they were deeply settled, you know, um, Odessa and Constantinople, to Paris. Why? Why would they move to Paris? And so this great question of, of, of why these families came and what they were doing, building these extraordinary houses on the edge of this new area, the Parc Mosso, uh, alongside lots of other families, this great movement of, of, of people. And so, you know, all the years that I was walking up and down the Rue de Monceau, trying to trace my family up to that house where Charles Frissy and my other great uncles lived, collecting impressionist paintings and Netsuke and lovers, but we don't go into that. <laughs> Just down the road was 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 the Camondo family, uh, and and so I was so conscious of this house there, um, this extraordinary house, which was intact, which seemed in miraculously intact, full of collections, full of art and tapestries and furniture and 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 miraculously intact, whereas. All my own family, the houses were despoiled, looted, uh, migratory, lost. But there was this one place that seemed to be intact. So, of course, it's been a mesmeric, a, a, a place of deep, unsettling interest for me now for, for 30 years. I don't know what your question was. I no. just started. <laughs> <laughs> I visited the, the houses... Uh, uh, winter with my son and I was you know the, the as you say the house is still there 
and it is such a wonderful house. And your pottery was there, which was, and it was so discreet, so humble, so wonderful, so precise. It was a fantastic ex exhibition you had. I came, but, but it was also kind of a strange experience because the house is there, but the family is not there. And the Ifrussi family, it's the other way around. Uh, you are you are with us. I am. With <laughs> You're a you. member of the family. Yeah. Yes, but 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 the Commando family mm. is no longer there. And uh, so that, uh, when you go and uh, it is kind of somber uh, when, when you go there. So, so, so maybe maybe it's important to describe the house. Yes, Should please. Let, let's let's start by walking down the road from the modest Efrasi Palace to the immodest Commando Palace. Bigger, uh, 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 and what you do is you come you come down the Rue de Monceau, and there are these great gates, huge gates, and you go through them across a graveled courtyard, and suddenly there's the Petit Trianon. <laughs> You're in the middle of Paris, but there's the Petit Trianon, um, and it's extraordinary. It's a, a Belle Époque palace built to emulate the Petit Trianon by uh, Moïse de Camondo by this. Um, extraordinary Jewish collector um, whose family comes from Constantinople. You walk through the doors of this, of this extraordinary house into a marble, a marble hall and there's a great staircase sort of gliding upwards. Mm -hmm. And wherever you look in this house, there are the best tapestries on the walls. There's um, Savonnerie carpets on the floors, there's um, more French furniture than you ever need to see in your life. Amazing, amazing uh, 18th century furniture and bronzes and chandeliers and, 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 and bronze. Bro everything is, is plural. Everything is more and more and more. And you realize as you walk through this extraordinary house, um, that you've come into a kind of theatre. That what Moïse de Camondo has done is to recreate in incredible, beautiful, uh, uh, nuanced. I'm doing this with my hands because I want you to feel the. First. You're not allowed to touch anything, but you, if you do. <laughs> <laughs> But you feel it when you, you do. read it. It's really rather wonderful. Um, uh, uh, and, and so what you've got is you've got this great theatre of 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 civilization of 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 eighteenth century France, and you think, why is this man, why is this man, um, doing this extraordinary act of what's he doing here? What what's is what's he? Why is this stage being set? Who's it being set for? Why is he doing it for himself? And so there's always this question when you walk across there. You know what's going on in this house, particularly when you realise that in his will, Moïse de Camondo, which he dies in 1936, leaving this incredible collection to France. In his will, he says nothing must be moved, nothing must be changed. Everything must stay exactly like it is. So when you go in, it's like you it's like he's just left to go to his club. You know, everything is extraordinarily exactingly placed. And what do you think he was trying to do? In a way being more French than the French, plus royal que le roi. You have to imagine he is the son of a first-generation immigrant. And what he's doing is, I know this, I close my eyes, I know this so well. He's assimilating. <laughs> he's doing this incredible act of hiding in plain sight of making something which is so Parisian and so perfect and so French. Um, he's making himself into the perfect French, civilized, 
gourmet sportsman collector giver of dinner parties patron of the arts um he's making himself more parisian than the parisian uh, uh, and 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 what he's doing in this it's a very particular homage it's a homage to a particular moment in france french life it's the moment of of the enlightenment of of the best moment in french history <laughs> it's the moment when the jews are given equality it's it's it, it's all these things are happening in this extraordinary theater that he creates on the Rue de Monceau. But one thing that Le Petit Trianon didn't have was a, as a kitchen, a kitchen for kosher food. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he, you know, it still is a Jewish house. It's it, it. OK, it's a Jewish house. And yet and yet and yet it's so interesting. So he does. <laughs> When his parents arrive from Constantinople, they build the most vulgar house in Paris. <laughs> and and um, Balzac, who is horrible, um, stands outside it and says, it's a de desecration <laughs> of the French soil. Um, you know, how can anyone be as vulgar as this? And it's got, you know, it's got more turrets and glass balustrades and, 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 and windows than you can believe possible. And in that house, in that house, um, there's more gold on the walls uh, and ceilings on the paintings on the ceilings. And there's an oratory, a Jewish oratory. And I know this house because it's exactly like my great grandparents' house in Venice, in Vienna, when they build the house on, on the Ringstrasse, the Palais of Frisie. It's exactly the same house. It is too big. <laughs> you know, the Palais of Frisie on the Ringstrasse takes up a block of Vienna, you know, and it is gilded and marbled to the ends of your fingertips. This is me not touching my family house. Uh, and, and, and this is the first commando house. And when, he in, when his father dies, he pulls the house down. Yes. You want a good Jewish story? You know, you want Freud? I mean, he, he pulls the house down and then he sends all, um, all the Jewish um, ritual objects from the oratory to the Musée de Cluny. They're all there. Mm -hmm. He takes away everything that's Jewish in-house and sends it to the Musée de Cluny and he takes away all the Orientalist pictures of bazaars and harems and, and minarets and, and, and sells them in a great auction and then builds the Petit Trinal. And then, as you say, it's a kosher kitchen. So what happens in the new house is it is intensely luxurious, you know, the best hot water system in Paris, the most amazing kitchens. If you go there, they're, people love the kitchens more than they love the salons anyway um but 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 it, so it's all it's covertly all there threading its way through the house your book in a way is a book about identity it's about many things but it is also about identity and i you know this morning i thought had commando been alive or one of his sons or daughters Today, they would have been able to get a Spanish passport because they were thrown out of Spain in 1492. <laughs> so identity is so many strange things. It is, it, is ab the th it is absolutely about identity. It's a book really about... It's a book about crossing a border and belonging. You begin somewhere and you choose another country. And that country, you love it. Mm -hmm. It becomes your country. You bring your children up um, in it. Um, you have grandchildren in Moise de Camondo's case. And you may teach them about the home country, about where you've been, but, but this is your place. And it doesn't matter whether it's It's Austria and Vienna and in the fin de siècle, or it's Paris at exactly the same moment. What you're doing is, is, you're, is, you're, is you're learning how to be yourself in a different place. And uh, that's intensely around a community. I mean, there, the Camondo and the Afrussi and the Caen d'Auvert and all these other families and the Reinach families, they all intermarry. I mean, you, you know, and they all go to the same synagogues and, and all that kind of stuff. 
the same in Vienna. Um, but at the same time, what you're doing is you're, is you're, you're profoundly listening to French culture. So when you look at that generation of people, um, Moise de Camondo's generation, they are unbelievably cultured. They are writing amazingly. They're, they're curating, they're collecting, um, uh, they're in politics, they're, they're in civil society, they're generous to the, to the ends of their fingertips. And what they're doing is, they're, is that they're, uh, they're proving themselves as good French citizens. And they're working really, really hard to prove that their identity is grounded in this new place, their identity. And, and that's one of the very, very sad things in, 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 in your book, in the story and in the story of the family, that, that there's so much loss. And f the, maybe the, the worst loss for, for Moise is the loss of his son. So Moise has two children. He has um, um, a son, Nisim, who in good Jewish tradition he calls after his grandfather. Um, and a daughter, Beatrice. And um, Nassim is, a, is he, he's not the brightest student, but he's a loyal and honorable and loving son. And we have all his letters, astonishing letters, pages after pages of them. And when the first war breaks out, he joins the army and he joins the flying corps. And he's very brave. He flies over the, the front taking photographs. And his plane is shot down and he, he's, he's killed in 1917. And there's this, I talk about it in the, in the book, there's this, this, there's this moment, these weeks, when he, Moise is waiting to know what's happened about his son. And there's this letter from Proust. And, and Proust, who's a friend and a neighbor, writes him the most beautiful letter saying i'm i'm with you in your i'm with you in this moment of uncertainty um proust is very much part of the book seems to be part of all my books but i'm sorry about that that's nothing you can do about it um and and then and 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 moise brings his the body of his son home and he's finally buried in in, in the family graveyard and at this moment this house, this great house, which had been, had been in some ways created for his son, to dynastically to be passed on to his son. That's when that's when Moise decides. Okay, no, this is going to become, and this is very, very important, a memorial. The book is, in many ways, a examination of what of the failure of memorials. That's something I could need to talk to you about. The, 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 sorry, this is me making notes on what I need to talk to you about. Um, did, um, it, it, it's a memorial for his son and, and a gift to France. And, and Beatrice, the daughter who my grandmother, uh, she was the second cousin of my grandmother, and my grandmother knew her very well. They didn't get on terribly well, but they, they knew each other. My grandmother Elizabeth used to visit them in the house when she was living in Paris. She marries a, um, a, a composer, a, a young Jewish composer, and they have two children. So the family is there in this house. It's a family house. Um, so, so the family continues, and 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 then there is this extraordinary thing about about the house being made then as a memorial to be handed over on his death to, to France. Could I ask you to read uh, a page from your book? You can from, from the the porcelain chapter. Yes, it's page yes. sixty three. Um, um, these are letters. I, I should explain that I, these are yes, letters. Yes, please. I, just if I'm allowed, sure. <laughs> Which is, this is a slightly odd, odd book. This is really me selling my book you, really well. You, um, <laughs> <laughs> you write I, letters to Mui. I write him letters. I I have to say that I, I it was I I decided I needed. I didn't even decide. I just found myself writing to him. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about letters is you can be inquisitive and amused and cross and very short or very long. Okay, c can I ask you a question yeah. before you read? Yeah. <laughs> you write letters to him. Yeah. Did you ever consider write, uh, writing the answers? Did, did, do you know, I'm such a 
bloody idiot. And until I got the book published and it was in my hands, I, I suddenly realized that he doesn't write back. And I, 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 it, sounds, it, it, it sounds ineffably obtuse and, and, and stupid. But the conversation I was having with him was so intense. I was sending these letters out to him, talking to him, bringing him up to date with the tragedy of what happened to his family, talking to him about identity and about belonging and, and food and dogs and things that matter. Um, and, 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 actually the, and actually, do you know what the extraordinary thing is, of course, the book is just full of silence. It's, 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 it's me sending out letters and not hearing anything back, which of course is exactly what real history is. I mean, uh, you know, I'm, it took, it, I just didn't realize. And also, sorry, I'm hogging the floor. It would the, be such a small step to fiction if you... I, I, I don't want to ventriloquize right. for someone I care about. And I don't do that in the hair with amber eyes. Right. I, 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 I don't use other people's voices, but I do stand alongside them. Does that make sense? Uh, very I, much. I, I, so. I, I, I walk in their yes. footsteps, but I don't use their voices. And that's a really important distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the thing about getting to know him is that I'm also really uncertain about how well I know him. And so throughout, throughout the book, I either call him Monsieur or Cher Monsieur or Dear Friend or Monsieur Le Comte. He's a count after all. And I'm only a potter for God's sake. So I'm kind of always trying to work out quite my, 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 my friendship level and my social state. But this one, you want me to read this one? Sorry I'll, for all these no, questions. No, I, I, no. Dear, no, Cher Monsieur. This is letter uh, uh, 23. You have a table set up for yourself in your porcelain room. This is refinement. The table is set with your cha chair facing the window onto the garden. The birds surround you. You eat alone. Augustus the Strong commissioned a porcelain menagerie from Meissen for one of his pleasure palaces. There is quite a lot of snarling and baring of teeth, but here you are in an aviary. The vitrines that surround you are generous, each with six shelves of Sèvres porcelain. Each vessel has the lightest of green borders, the colour of early spring, studded with pheasant eye pattern. The eye of a partridge, maybe, a dot of gold against the white porcelain ground, circled by cobalt blue dots. Each of the panels that holds the decoration of birds is framed in gold so that this toucan, this missile thrush, has its own little patch of the world, a rock to sit on, a bush to sing at. And then there are grey monochrome medallions of classical busts and a gilded rim, because this is Sèvres, and they never know when to stop. Not knowing when to stop is pretty much a definition of European porcelain. This porcelain with its custard cups, and salts and ice pails and plates comes from Les Services au Oiseaux Bouffons. Each vessel has the name of the bird or birds written in copper plate writing on the base along with the Sèvres mark and year number. I wonder if this means you could upend your compotier oval to check if you had correctly identified the Tyrann Huppé de Cayenne or Faison Vertre de Cayenne, that both strut on this grand oval dish. I worry slightly about eating a roast pheasant from a dish that shows a pheasant. <laughs> but what I love about this is that all these images of birds are taken from the thousand engraved plates from Buffon's Histoire Naturelle. Careful, scholarly Buffon, adumbrating the world, painstakingly marking out the differences and similarities of the whole of the natural world, and all that knowledge becomes a glorious excuse for a dinner service. The Enlightenment. Even better, the French Enlightenment. Talk and food and porcelain and politesse 
and civilité and everything possible. Thank so you. that's how you have to go home and have your supper. <laughs> yeah. I think it's such a wonderful chapter. Thank you. And also a bit sad because talk, you see, everything wonderful, everything French talk, but his alone, his alone in this po wonderful porcelain room. He's Who does he talk with? He's intensely alone and he's talking with ghosts. That's the extraordinary thing. So he, so, you know, I'm, I'm slightly odd. <laughs> very odd but I have a very intense relationship with objects and with the people who make objects and I think Monsieur Le Comte my friend walks around his house where his children are not living and his grandchildren aren't living with his 14 servants who live in the servants quarters and he talks to the 18th century cabinet maker who laid down the beautiful veneer on that amazing piece of furniture, or the silversmith who made the candelabra, or the, or, or, or the person who designed um, the Savonnerie carpets, and, uh, or, or Buffon. He's waiting. He's waiting for Voltaire to ring the bell and come in and talk to him. I mean, he, he really is. And he's intensely alone. But it's, a, but it's the kind of obsessional aloneness of a collector that you come across again and again this inhabiting of of other worlds while being in this one it, it's it's not uncommon it's just taken to an intense degree with Moïse de Commandeau. One of the things he lost or not the things one of the persons he lost was his wife he was divorced for me it is also a book about divorce <laughs> Uh, he 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 lives. Uh, don't you think he imagined it that he would live the great? It was before he he built the house, but anyhow that he would. He was planning for the great family life in Paris with wife, children, and then she runs off. She he's he's planning a dynastic life. I mean, they they all plan dynastic lives. I mean, I don't know how long you've got. But if I can tell you about the love affairs of my French cousins <laughs> then in the <laughs> earlier part, I, when I published The Hair with Amber Eyes, suddenly all these people wrote to me and said, you may not know this, but we are related <laughs> because <laughs> you cannot believe the amount of... Sorry, this is so off color. I must stop completely there. Um, um, Moïse de Camondo's wife runs off with their riding instructor, who's a bad sort. This has been being very English. He wears a monocle. Uh, uh, and is uh, Gentile, and he, she runs off with a good-looking riding instructor, etc. Um, um, yeah, of course he's planning. He's planning. He's planning. He's planning for a dynastic life with family. You know, and a certain moment, you know, he doesn't. At a certain moment, he he segues that. He changes that into into this obsessive making of a memorial. So he's a making a memorial for his son. He's making um, this, this planned gift um, of, of the house and the collections to France. And, 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 and happily, Beatrice and Léon and their children move off to some very smart part of Paris um, um, to, to live there. Um, and, and, you know, are taking with them uh, an amazing Renoir portrait um, of... Um, of uh, the, 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 the Beatrice's mother. In your in your book, there are, there are glimpses of um, being critical towards uh, Moise Camando in your book, and one of the glimpses is when you go into his bedroom and you see this nude. Uh, um, oh, his, his, ta his taste is he has lapses of taste, <laughs> um, and I. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, by this point, I I feel that I'm I'm. I feel a little like a grandson. I feel like I'm... The thing is th I, that I'm able to say to him, you know what, really, not such a great idea. Really very bad nude. Um, <laughs> but you see, the thing is... The thing is well, about also, a nude in, the, in a bedroom? Yeah, I mean, come on. But I mean, <laughs> it's, you know, it's like Monte Carlo or somewhere. It's <laughs> sort of... 
but 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 seriously, I mean, the thing is that he is exactly the same age and generation as my great grandfather Victor. Um, you know, and Victor comes from Odessa, exactly the same time, etc., etc., etc. And so I I I know this man. You know, I know what he's doing, and I feel I feel close enough to him to 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 point out with some some affectionate acidity <laughs> some things about his life yes I've, I've, when i visited the house i i felt his loneliness and and when i saw this bedroom i i, I also i thought wow this is a man who was who divorced 10 years ago but but, but it's the same loneliness as as charles swan yes we ha Proust is in the room. We can't get rid of Proust. It's the you know the end. You know Proust. Proust says you know there's there's the there's the moment of when the collector has to close the vitrine. You know and say I I I'm have to leave these things. I have to leave my library. I have to leave my collections behind. But at least I loved things. You know. But at least I loved them. At least I was engaged properly and intensely. Um, with the world of ideas and the world of of my hands and, and my thoughts, yeah. so so you know what loneliness, yes, but there are worse things than loneliness. You know, he's not disconnected to the world; he's just lonely, and those are different things. I think one of the critical um, ways that Post looks at Swan yeah. maybe is that he he considers Swan in a way disconnected from the world because he he cannot really touch the world as anything but art. Mm. Even 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 his maîtress uh, uh, and uh, mm. and uh, later wife, she looks as uh, he looks at her as a piece of art. Yes, and and maybe Mr. Camondo does the same thing. I think probably I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I. Is this an hour or four hours? Because <laughs> I immediately I fall into the rabbit hole. Please. Of, of uh, well, I, you might not say that actually. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, these nice people here might not say that. But the rabbit hole of 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 how so one one of one of the things in this book is 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 rescuing people from art. Um, there's, there's a, an incredibly important part of this book which is that there is um, an amazing portrait of Irene, Irene Kayan d'Anvers. So she's another cousin, another Jewish cousin in the family. Um, and she's, um, and Charles Frissi uh, persuades her parents. Her, her, uh, Irene's mother is Charles Frissi's mistress, <laughs> etc. And Charles persuades Renoir to paint this portrait. And it's a beautiful portrait. It's an extraordinary portrait of a young Jewish girl. Um, um, and, and, and this is a portrait which stays in the family. It's a very significant portrait. And this is the portrait which is looted in 1940. It's chosen um, by Goering for his collections and then swapped on and on and on and on. And, and it, it has this parallel life, this piece of art, this portrait of a real girl, a real woman, has this parallel life in people's collections, bought and sold and looted and restituted and then sold to an arms dealer and now in a museum. And this, this, this horrible, chaotic life of this painting and the woman who's in the painting is lost. It is lost to the storytelling. And what I'm trying to do, this is a very long way of saying that what I'm trying to do in this book, as I did in The Hair with Amber Eyes, is to, is to, is to reconnect places and objects and rooms and, 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 and the, 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 the feeling of the arm of the armchair with the person who sat in it and was a real person, you know, and, and bring that back to some kind of, of tensile reality. It's in a ridiculous and impossible hope, but, but, but it's that restoring 
or restituting of a story and a family back from the art by going deeply into the art that matters to me. There's a quotation by Benjamin in, in the book about the, uh, the, the character of the, of the collector. Mm. And I thought when I read this quotation that it was kind of a description of you uh, also, mm. this uh, being provoked by the, by the mess in which the world is and trying to bring things back into order. I mean, I mean, I, I have a day job. I mean, I'm a proper potter, <laughs> you know, and I, I, I make things, you know, that's, that's my life. I, I'm very old. I've been doing this a long, long, long time. Oh, you're not that I old. Re no, I've really been doing this for a long time. And, and, and what I'm doing is making objects and then, f you know, I, this is why I love Moïse de Commando, bring things into energy, to bringing them into installation. It's a horrible world. It's a art, nasty art world term. But bring them into, into groupings and, and just briefly, you know, making them still or, 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 or bringing them into some kind of connection. It's sort of what Morandi does in his paintings, is to bring things together and, and look at them hard. And that's what I'm doing. And uh, that's what I'm doing both with what I do with my hands and, and, and also in my books in some ways, to bring things into focus and, and put them back into a different kind of configuration and look at them, knowing, absolutely knowing, that they're going to fall apart again. Which is why this matters. Because Moïse de Camondo thought he could escape history. He thought that he could make this house as a memorial and pass it on to France and everyone would knew the, that the Camondos loved France and that France loved Camondo and he's doing this thing he's making this installation and passing it into the future and it doesn't work it doesn't work now the, the porcelain is broken it doesn't work because you haven't read the book but what happens but You've read the book. <laughs> but you ha I, what happens is so appalling. Yes. Which is that, you know, 1936, he gives the house to France. It becomes a museum the next year. It's hugely popular. There's a guidebook. There are queues of people down the Rue de Monceau to see this new museum in Paris. It's astonishing. 37, you know, Great ceremony in, in, in that beautiful graveled court, courtyard. The Minister of Culture accepting it on behalf of France in gratitude. And 1940, the Wehrmacht walk, it, walk in unopposed to Paris. And the day before Vichy edicts are, are announced about stripping Jews from jobs. And every day there becomes this drumbeat of of this of the of the you, uh, the attritional separating of of the of the french jewish population of 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 where they can sit in a park where they can stand in a metro from their bicycles and their radio sets to wearing a yellow star to their possessions, to rounding them up, to Drancy, that horrific concentration camp guarded by French policemen, the buses going, driven by the French bus companies of Paris, taking people from the Velodrome d'Hiver to Drancy. And, 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 and Beatrice, Camondo and her husband Leon Reinach and their children, who th who write letters saying, but we've, but we, but but we've given this, but we've done that, but my uncle sponsored the Musée de Cluny, but 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 we're French, yes. and and the letters are in the archives, and there's the scribble in the margins of. The letters which say "ne pas libre" don't know, and they're in Drancy, and and 
in you know that th- you want to know about archives that the, the the romance of archives the 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 extraordinary archives in the in the in the attics of the musée camondo untouched and full of beautiful letters and wonderful wills and um and and menus and hunting records and mm-hmm. glorious things and then the deportation cards yes Terrible. because they are deported and they are murdered yes. in auschwitz and that is five years after that ceremony of giving this memorial yes. to France. In, in this way, your book is also a very harsh book about France, which is the, the country of enlightenment and talk and wonderful things and porcelain and so on, but it is also the very same authorities which who accepted uh, this house and this museum, this gift, a few years later, they round up the Jews, even the Jews who gave them this house. It's everyone. So it's the it's the Jews who give houses and collections, and it's the it's the seamstress in the Marais who has nothing. It's it's the same act of 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 erasure. The same act of 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 the deliberative act of taking away the dignity of 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 your fellow citizens it, it you know it's a tough book on france there aren't enough tough books on france that's the reality i think it's fucking dreadful excuse my language that's an english <laughs> word um <laughs> by how how little i'm sorry i really shouldn't have used that word but it, it is it is palpably true that there are not That, that that you walk through Paris and you are not aware. You walk through Paris and I am powerfully aware of the houses where families were deported from. I walk down the Rue de Monceau and I can tell you which children lived in which houses. And I can tell you where the SS were billeted and I can tell you where the Miliche were 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 headquartered and where Himmler visited, and I can tell you that you can walk down that affluent bourgeois street in Paris and have not the faintest idea of what happened. And you can walk into the Musée Camondo, and there's a very small plaque underneath the big yes, plaque yes. that was says this was given to, in 1937. And it's a small thing which says about Beatrice and Leon and their two children, and it says died for France and you think no we were talking about the uh, Stolperstein the Le, Pierre de Chopin uh, these stones that you find in Berlin and in many other countries you don't find them in Paris in front of the houses but that, there really should be some of these Pierre de Chopin stones in front of these the Ifrissi and the uh, and, and especially the Commando Palais. It it's it it's it's never you know what? I mean so this is this is this is this is very much th- um the last letters in the book are very much around memorial me talking to him about memorial you know and and the f- the f- the fact is that m- memorials are profoundly inadequate they are going to fail they can never fill the space of the loss But that doesn't mean to say that there's not an active need to reinvent memorial continuously, to go back to the space of loss and 
reconnect to it, and that can be Stolpersteine, which I think are extraordinary. There's um, um, a quote, I don't know where it is, by Jean Amery, um, 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 the wonderful... Um, um, I'm not ever going to find it. <laughs> if you read the book, there is an extraordinary quote by Jean Amery, who survived Auschwitz, the great Austrian writer. Um, um, and um, here it is. Um, actually, can I read you this? Can, just just a little pleasure. bit. Sorry. Yes. With pleasure. It's, it's actually... It, I, I, I actually talk about the fact that the hair with amber eyes fails because I try and make a memorial for my family and it doesn't fill the gap. It does some things. It brings my father back to Vienna and it makes him present in Vienna again. Um, um, sorry. Bear with me, this is it. Your house, they say, is a fitting tribute to the memory of Nisim, your father, Nisim, your son. Walk around the Musee Nisim de Camondo. It is just so. My book on the collection passed down to me, The Hair with Amber Eyes, is a fitting tribute to a lost family naming the dead, saying their names as a way of making it cohere. I make a book an attempt to try and work out what it is to pass things on. If I can pass on this, then I'm not passing on other responsibilities, that archival weight. I dedicate it, the book to my father and to my children. It is just so, but I no longer believe this. It isn't like this. It just doesn't work. Tribute and restitution sound like the end, sound like closure. But Jean Amery writes, I do not have clarity today, and I hope that I never will. Clarification would amount to disposal, settlement of the case, which can then be placed in the files of history. Nothing is resolved, nothing is settled, no remembering has become mere memory. I feel this is true. History is happening. It isn't the past, it's a continuing unfolding of the moment. It unfolds in our hands. That is why objects carry so much. They belong in all of the tenses, unresolved, unsettling essays. It's, it's the, it's, it's, nothing is resolved, nothing is settled. And, and that's, that's absolutely my feeling about the house, that this is the house the house is this attempt of Moise to, to resolve and settle things and pass them on. And there it is, and people go to this beautiful house in Paris and think, what a perfect museum. But it's an unsettled, unresolved, and painful place. And, and, and that's, that's why I have to write to him and bring back that unsettledness. Does that make sense? Very much so. Um, and Proust is still in the room, I think. Uh, um, he, Proust says that the best part of our, our memory is what we have forgotten, uh, because then we don't touch it, it and then so, so it is still alive because we don't because we, if a story we tell and tell over and over again, it kind of uh, degenerates or, or gets. It gets stiff, and, and and sooner or later it kind of dies. Whereas if you had forgotten it, it is still alive in the things. Yes. And and and, and, and the things are like a memory. You you stumble on a stone, and it's like a memory stick. Yes. My whole memory. That's where my memory was. It wasn't in here. It was in the stone. It's 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 an odd thing because immediately I want to say no, as well because. There's a, 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 a bit in the hair with amber eyes where I'm I'm picking up a netsuke, one of these little Japanese objects that I inherited, and it's been it's been in so many people's hands that it's like a memory of a fox. It's been worn away. It's just like just just a nose and a tail left. And I'm thinking of all the people who have touched it 
you know, from Charles Frissy to Proust and Renoir and all the way through my lovely late grandmother and Iggy and and then on into Japan and now my children and and there's this feeling of of all this memory of which is erosion but it's eroding down to a more um a, a more intense memory uh, and how so how do you ever talk about that um well one of the reasons you, you do it is you you flip it from the object into into words and you use the image of the palimpsest which i know is something you know the palimpsest is is where you have a piece of writing and where you write on top of it again and again and again so you have a text um on vellum or parchment where where one text is on top of another on top of another and you can't read the texts below but you know they're there and so you have this layering one which is an erosion through touch which is a kind of memory and the other is a layering of one thing on top of another and they're very very close only walter benjamin would be able to understand mm -hmm. quite how to describe that but they are very palpably tactilely close to each other that was a rubbish answer to your question no no, <laughs> no. on the contrary it was a wonderful answer we could i think we could i would like to talk for days hours days weeks months unfortunately we can't but in you have a chapter in your book where you c kind of uh, say the same thing in a kind of conversation with Montaigne. <laughs> Uh, all the things you could you could have a conversation about. You would have liked to have this conversation with Moshe or Mo Moise. Uh, and when I when I th saw this chapter, I, I I thought that maybe you foresaw that uh, that I would feel that when we leave this room, I, there would be so many things I would have liked to speak to you about. <laughs> So well, maybe I, I, I would love to read it, but I have no idea what page it's on, so I've, I've lost the page. So, given you're I so will clever, you will be able to find the page. 113. 113. Uh, chapter 41. Yes. I, actually, actually, that's a perfect end, actually. I'll, I'll read you this, we I'll read you this, and then we'll run away and have a drink. Um, 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 chapter 41. Um, Cher Monsieur, I'm on my more formal more formal letter <laughs> as you have a number of books of essays in your library i thought i'd suggest some topics to discuss together in the manner of montaigne on why you keep carbon copies of everything on placement at dinner parties and on the placement of furniture in the house and the connection between these two actions on being partly deaf on being partly blind on bed, how do you sleep in a bed that size? On Kaddish, on the sounds of the kitchen, on being exigent, on the papers. Figaro comes daily, Le Gauloir comes daily, L'Illustration comes monthly, Revue de la Art comes monthly, Gazette de Beaux-Arts comes monthly. On mirrors, on glass, on surfaces that reflect and surfaces that don't. On the Bacante, really? I really didn't like his picante. On smell, on chamomile and montrachet, on the sounds of children in the house, on the sounds of silver on porcelain, on the sounds of the gardener clipping the box hedges, on those lunches you gave the Louvre curators. How long does a luncheon last? On sitting for portraits, Carolas Durin and Boldoni and Renoir. How do you choose? What is it like to see a portrait of yourself at the salon? On family graves, on how you greet people. Visitors to the house can arrive by horse, by car, on foot. Discuss. On what the dealers are trying to sell you now. There is an envelope from X in London with six photographs. They have the pleasure inviting you to take the opportunity of reserving these works. Highly significant exemplar of the work of Y from Le Garde Meuble de la Reine. Let me beg of you that you take this. It ought to strike the perfect note alongside your other treasures, etc. On comfort in your museum. 
Since visitors usually keep their coats on, only this entrance should be used, especially as it is more economical. On enlightenment, the liberation of the Jews, the abolition of slavery, on provenance in objects and on provenance in family, family trees as inventories, on trees, on privet, all for now. I'll wait to hear which we should attempt. Essays are a start of conversation, contingent and digressive. You cannot be completely sure where they will lead you. Well, a final one then. The shape of my library is round, the only flat side being the part needed for my table and chair, and curving round me, it presents at a glance all my books, writes Montaigne in his essay of three kinds of association. So finally, on having round libraries, Michel de Montaigne and Moïse de Camondeau. Edmund Deval, thank you very much.